Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. Adam, a few weeks ago, there was an article that was published by a professor named Alan Gwynn, and it had the InfoSec industry basically up in arms. And I alluded to this last week with our episode with Doug Turchak on security leadership. And that's a great episode. If you guys haven't heard it, I highly recommend that you go back and listen to that one. But we're going to talk about this article a little bit. As soon as I read the article, I knew I wanted to talk about it. And what we're not going to do is we're not going to bash Professor Gwynn at all because I think it is brave that he published his opinions on this op-ed. Wrong as they may be, he was still brave enough to put his thoughts out there for people. And one of the things that it did do was it got people talking about InfoSec and how we can make it better. And so he used his platform to voice his opinions, and we're going to use ours to basically voice ours and counter some of his thoughts. I also was really impressed that he was on LinkedIn responding to people left and right. So, Andy, it looks like you had some dialogue with him. I know a former CISO that I follow on LinkedIn, and he was engaging with him too. So it takes a lot of fortitude to have people talking about you, especially in a negative way or really strongly disagreeing with you and to go right at them and have measured and thoughtful responses. Professor Gwen is not stupid. This is a smart man. We might disagree with him, but this comes from a place of intelligence and comes from a, a real, like you said, honesty and and bravery to to put it out there and then to stand up for it, to defend it, as opposed to crumple and kind of back off from what he said, for the most part, he has continued to defend his work, which is interesting. Um, and, and again, I also think brave and respectable as well. But as we talk on the show, I think we're going to have some healthy disagreement with some of his points as well. And some people might ask why even engage or, or counter some of his thoughts, because you may think he's just a internet troll or, maybe wrote this op-ed as satire and it's not, I mean, these are his real thoughts and I think it's important to at least give our thoughts as InfoSec professionals in the industry because he is a professor at a university. He's able to influence young minds, teach them things about what his opinions are made of and the op-ed that he published on the Hill. I mean, that's not a small you know, uh, editorial. I mean, it has real reach. And so my fear is that someone will actually read his article and maybe perhaps agree with him thinking that these are possibly good ideas when in fact, I think a lot of them are not good. He does make a couple of points with which I'll secede that may be some good points, but we'll talk through it. So as you read through the article, one of the things that he does is that he paints infosec industry as this one broad brush and if you listen to adam and i talk about infosec there's a lot of pillars of infosec especially when it comes to practitioners and then i think some of his articles based on leadership maybe the people who are making the decisions within the infosec industry and at companies so it's hard to do this because number one a lot of different pillars in InfoSec in general, right? You got defenders, you have red team, you have compliance. I mean, there's there's the whole gamut of that, as well as every sector of the industry is different in general, like manufacturing or government, healthcare, financial sectors. The things that they focus on are different. The safeguards and the best practices, which Professor Gwynn refers to, 
are generally the same across the board. But the point is that not everyone is doing the best practices as well as not every single information security professional has the same set of knowledge or experience or tools to work with. One of the things I think is an opportunity in the InfoSec industry is a standardization of our education and basically to say a baseline of experience that you need before you can say, hey, I'm, I'm capable of doing this job. With the exception of maybe certifications, I think we have talked about certifications quite a bit on the show, but that's probably the closest thing that we have to some sort of standardization that you can say, hey, if you've passed this test, we know that you have at least some basic knowledge of InfoSec. What do you think, Adam? Yeah, it, it, it's one of those things, and, and I you know, I kind of want to hold back my thoughts till you get to your next point, but there is opportunity here. As we, as we go through the discussion tonight, there is opportunity from, from what he says in his article where we shouldn't just say, yeah, everything's good. You know, everything's fine. Like, leave us alone. We're doing a great job. Um, we're not doing a great job. There's a ton of room for improvement. And having some self-reflection about like, why aren't we better at this is a conversation we should be having. And that might make people uncomfortable to say as a whole, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm really trying to be um, aggressive and say like, we all suck at this, but we, we have a lot of work to do as, as an industry, as a whole. And there isn't a magic bullet to get there. And, and I do agree that, having more standardization would help. But I think if you zoom out to be candid, the, and okay, so I, I guess I am just kind of sounding um, almost grumpy old man at this point. But when I got out of college and I joined my first company, which was a huge tech company, one of the founding fathers of the tech industry, and I got there and I was blown away at how poorly run it was, how bad the IT department was, how awful the user experience was. It was garbage, like just absolutely painful and terrible. And you give people these tools and expect them to use those tools every day was gross, just awful in terms of like, I had a ticketing system I had to use that this tech company built in house um, because they're a big company and this only worked in like whatever version of Internet Explorer was current at the time. So it's like only an IE six. And it literally took like two minutes to load every single page refresh. Like that is not acceptable or a pleasant way to do our jobs. And ultimately that doesn't lead to like a security breach or, or a security issue or a security incident. But when that attitude of good enough, when it's not good enough, spills over into information security, you start to get what we have today. And so I guess maybe I am trying to kind of blow the whole thing up here, but in general, this whole industry has done a poor job and passed it off as good enough. And what happens now is we're starting to pay the price for that because we have really, really talented adversaries and attackers who are going after those weaknesses. And a lot of the advice that we're going to walk through maybe isn't the right way to go about it, but what did hit me, what struck a nerve from this article is the idea that, well, we say, well, we're doing these best practices. We're following this. And I think as we talk through it, we're going to say, well, actually, most organizations don't follow best practice. That's the problem. And I totally agree with that. But if best practices are so unattainable that nobody has achieved this adequate level of protection, then maybe we're doing something wrong with that, too. If, if it is something we can't get to. So I, I'm going to step off my soapbox and we're going to continue the discussion, but I'm a little fired up tonight. And so I'm excited to talk about this. When you read through <laughs> his article, the first point that he makes is that despite all the work that we've been doing in the security industry, breaches continue to happen. And this is despite an army of professionals with certifications, master's degrees, PhDs, and it continues to happen. And he's making a point that 
these people who have all these certifications and degrees are just paper pushers. They get this certification and it doesn't mean anything. They're not technically sound. And one of his points is, is that people need to be technical in information security. And then when there's a breach, he says that we always come up with someone else to blame. Perhaps it was the user who was unaware that their computer was exploited or the vendor, third-party software or equipment that was compromised. And I think he does have a point in the fact that some people in this industry gain certifications or degrees. And that doesn't mean a whole lot. You know, Adam and I have talked about that before. I think experience makes a huge difference in how you do things and how you secure things. When it talks about technical people, I do think it's important that you have a technical background. Last week, we talked to Doug. Doug is the information security officer at Exact Sciences, and he came up through IT. You know, he started at a support desk and he worked his way up through IT. He has that deep technical knowledge, not as much anymore that he's, you know, in the information security decision maker position now, but that background helps communicate with his subordinates, with the people that he manages, with the other teams in IT. And I think that that is important. If you are like someone in finance and you've never managed information security or IT in general, and they make you a CISO. I think there are some skill sets that will translate over like risk mitigation. That perhaps is something that you can use in the CISO position. But if you don't have any technical IT background, it makes it tough to understand how to mitigate those risks. A concept I talk about a lot whenever I'm learning something, me personally, is kind of building out my scaffolding or my kind of mental model of whatever concept I'm working with. And I don't have to fill in all of the details of it, but if I have kind of the rough outline of how all the pieces fit together, then as I am exposed to new information, I'm able to put those pieces in the appropriate place and I understand how they fit into the whole. So you may not necessarily need a chief information security officer that can explain like a TCP packet handshake, like ACK, SYNACK, all that stuff. But it would be a good idea if they know what TCP IP is and maybe some fundamental concepts of you know, IP addresses and basic, I mean, not pretty basic stuff. I mean, in all honesty, there's, there's a difference, like how deep it needs to be. But if you have something, then you have that mental model to put everything in. So I certainly think there is, there is opportunity to do better there. And this is something organizations are still trying to figure out where there isn't even consensus in reporting structure for a CISO. Do they report directly to the board? Do they report to the CEO? Do they report to the CIO? Are they actually part of the C-suite? Because a lot of them, they hold that title, but they don't actually get to hang out with the big boys or the good old boys, you know? And, and so their opinion is sometimes seen as lesser than perhaps their peer in the CIO. And really those probably should be peer roles anymore today, but they're not an almost 98% of organizations is probably pretty rare where those are seen as equal footing roles. Um, so, so yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity there because it starts at the top. Um, and we talk on this show a lot about all of the work CISOs have to do to properly have risk understood by the business to have the board and leadership invest in security headcount and tooling and everything they need and to win that funding, even when it's difficult to show the return on investment and to articulate the risk and to properly evaluate the likelihood of an event and the cost of an event. There's so much that's put on their plates. And honestly, maybe, maybe there's, you know, opportunity for improvement there. And then to his point that, you know, we always come up with someone to blame. The IT industry at an enterprise is a lot different today than it was 20 years ago. 
just like the economy is different. We're highly dependent on third-party software, third-party hardware, whereas 20, 30 years ago, everything was in-house, right? You, you owned your firewalls and you managed those and no one got in because it was your castle and you secured everything within those firewalls. And today you have the cloud and you have personal devices. Back 30 years ago, nobody had phones that were capable of connecting to company data. Nobody had tablets that were capable of connecting to company data. Many people didn't have computers, smartwatches, yeah, capable of connecting to company networks. And so there's a lot of risk sharing and risk transferring to those third-party providers like Microsoft, like other companies that provide services, maybe cloud um, sharing providers like Box or Dropbox. And so because we don't own all the risk and we don't own all of the product and the defense of that, then something that happens to those people may affect our security, just like with solar winds. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a fundamental disconnect of how technology works today where he wants to kind of roll back to 30 years, but we can't roll back to 30 years, right? We, We have all of these holes in our defenses now because everything is so wide open. This is a broader conversation than just information security. It's it's IT in general has transitioned to a buy instead of build model, and it's the right model. 100% it's the right model. And so I agree with you that there's some of a rollback here to 20 years ago where IT built a lot of stuff in-house. Almost everything was built in-house. That wasn't more secure, not by any means. It just wasn't being exploited. Um, that's, that's not a direction we should go. That is not uh, something we should lean towards. And so you're right that it's just different today with, with how we manage risk and who assumes the risk and where's the risk owned and transferred and all of that. And, and that's here to stay, but that doesn't mean we can't do a better job around it. I mean, I, I think of kind of zooming out a little bit and going back to one of the first things you talked about in this area, when you were quoting, um, the professor, was around you have people with certifications, advanced degrees, master's, doctorate, um, and that were paper pushers. And again, I'm not going to pretend like I walked out of college from Iowa State with not that high of a GPA, mind you, with a a four-year bachelor's degree in management information systems, and that I knew everything. But I will say as well, like when I interned, and then when I got out in the real world, I was stunned absolutely stunned with how much time is spent pushing paper in IT. It is astounding. And so even today, now that I've gained hopefully some maturity and some perspective and everything else, I still sometimes run into people who I think exist only to justify their own existence. And I'm picking on people right now and I apologize, but um, I'll give an example. A lot of times the way enterprise software is purchased at big companies is through a process called an RFP or request for proposal. This is a terrible process that is designed to artificially construct boundaries and barriers around software so it can be evaluated in a vacuum. So we can look at it just apples to apples against other products. There is no software that is used that way in the real world. Software exists in an ecosystem as part of many other software products. Nobody uses an endpoint management solution by itself. They use it in concert with an identity management solution and an endpoint protection platform and a whole bunch of other tools and agents that run on an endpoint. But there is an entire class of IT practice, vendor management, vendor governance, asset management, whatever it's called in your organization, where people construct these artificial processes with spreadsheets and very strict communications with vendors to evaluate the software and make it quote unquote fair. Now, what actually happens is people end around it and ensure that their preferred vendor wins the award anyways, and we waste a bunch of other people's time. It's a complete paper pushing exercise that doesn't evaluate how software works in the real world. And that's a perfect example of how an entire 
career category in IT has grown up that serves no real world purpose. It is designed to artificially construct barriers to create an artificial sense of fairness in purchasing. And in reality, it, it leads to you buying software that doesn't actually integrate with anything else because you're evaluating it in a quote unquote vacuum that doesn't exist. And so I said I was fired up tonight and I am a little bit, but the, again, there's a little bit of a point here where we are, have so much process and procedure around what we're trying to do. And if IT asset management comes in and says, well, you need to evaluate this endpoint protection platform that you're looking to buy through an RFP process. And we need to issue an RFP to CrowdStrike and to Microsoft and to Trend Micro and to Sophos and whomever. And you make them all come in and you say, you have two hours, fill out this spreadsheet and give us this canned demo. And by the way, don't ever talk about how that integrates with your CASB or your identity solution or anything else, even though that's how you're going to deploy it in the real world. That's where we get some of this stuff. And that's where the professor is not wrong is that that is not a way stuff should actually work and it's it's incredibly frustrating and it's very very real and it happens more often at bigger enterprises than smaller ones and bigger enterprises we generally think are going to have the resources to be better protected but this is where they get in their own way and trip over their own feet you say how how does this happen it happens because of stuff like rfps for procurement Step off my soapbox again for a second and catch my breath. <laughs> so the main point that Professor Gwynn is trying to get across, which I think is wrong, but his main point is industry best practices for InfoSec are not best practices and that they're dangerous practices. And he doesn't really define industry best practices. What he says is a lot of times when there's a breach, the company will claim that they're using industry best practices. Yes, we are secure. We take your security seriously. We employ the best practices for the industry. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I replied to him in a LinkedIn comment because he said a lot of times, like in the case of Colonial uh, Pipeline, they haven't really disclosed why they were breached. But my suspicion is that it was due to some lack of funding or understaffed or they didn't have the best practices in place like they didn't patch or they didn't have mfa turned on something like that it hasn't been disclosed yet but professor Gwynn said okay well there's not enough information but they claim to adhere to best practices so either one that claim is not accurate or two the best practice did not work i said it's almost always the first one mm -hmm. they did not adhere to best practices and so, you know, that in itself, I think, is the the point that he's missing is that we claim to have these best practices, but not everyone is doing the best practices. Mm -hmm. He also says that some of our best practices, like Adam was saying with the RFP process, kind of get in our own way in the fact that they may create a more bureaucratic process or red tape for people to try and investigate or do things that may help prevent breaches. He gave an example of the least privileged model, which we've talked about on the show before. Mm -hmm. Now, what he was saying is that, for example, if a network admin is investigating some sort of anomaly on the network, he can't investigated as far as like to a certain endpoint because he may not have privileges on the endpoint or on the server. You know, he may have to contact the server admin in order to investigate the anomaly on the server, or he may have to engage someone else to investigate it on the endpoint. And so the model of least privileged access keeps him boxed out of the investigation. And as well as for server admins, if there was some sort of anomaly on the network, they wouldn't have access to it. Like if there was some sort of insider that was siphoning a ton of data and downloading something, they wouldn't be able to see that. I kind of disagree with him on this as well because least privileged is important, right? You want to mitigate that risk instead of granting privileged access to something that 
you don't need all the time. Like it's a just in case type deal. Most of the time, the information security tools are the ones that kind of see across the board, especially in larger or- organizations. In smaller organizations, there's usually a generalist who may have the access to all the things. You may only have one network guy and maybe one information security guy and one server guy, or maybe that's just one guy and he has access to all the things. And so they're able to kind of see across the board. But in larger organizations, once you start growing these teams, they start to become more specialized in what they do and you do have to collaborate. I often say I don't want rights to users' computers. I absolutely do not want that because I have privileged access to other things, but I certainly don't want local admin on anything that I don't need local admin on. If I need it, I'll engage a team member who has those rights. And he also kind of alludes to the fact that, you know, again, seeing that information security folks are paper pushers, he alludes to the fact that like network admins and server admins are more skilled than InfoSec professionals. You know, he says instead of impressively credentialed paper savvy information professionals, hire competently skilled, uh, technically skilled professionals. So I think that there are skilled people in all the industries, but I don't think that network and server are more technically competent than information security professionals, especially at the practitioner level. At the CISO level, most definitely. I mean, there's probably a ton of network and server admins that are more technically competent than CISOs. But at the practitioner level, I know that there are a ton of very technically sound people at the practitioner level. So in all, I think he's very wrong about this. Like the best practices are very good. Now to Adam's point in the beginning, maybe our best practices are unattainable and maybe we should reevaluate that. But I don't think these breaches are happening because the best practices are wrong. It's because people aren't following the best practices. Agree. Here's a part where I'm going to completely diverge from agreeing with professor Gwynn in any way. This is wrong. Best practices are sound. They really do make sense for the most part, but let's use a little bit of an analogy. So passwords, mathematically, we understand that the more character sets we include as potential characters for a password, obviously the more combinations there are, this becomes a math problem, right? When, as opposed to 26 options, instead of 52 options, instead of 62, you know, you add in the whole character set and you've got however many, it's a lot. And we say mathematically, well, that makes sense. That's going to make passwords more complex, but humans don't write passwords that way. They write passwords in a predictable format. And so by forcing the use of uppercase, lowercase number symbol, users actually tend to follow very predictable patterns when they do that. And so you never achieve the goal of that best practice. That was best practice for passwords was to do that. And that's boomeranged around in recent years to say, you know what, actually all complexity requirements, they don't really help because users tend to use them to actually make their passwords more predictable. If we get rid of them and add length instead, that even though there's fewer characters that can appear in each you know, chunk of the password overall will, will increase security. And why are we doing password rotation? What, what does that make sense for? So best practices do change over time. And sometimes we do have to adjust where we're coming from a theoretical perspective of like mathematically, this makes sense. Absolutely agree with you, but that doesn't map to how human beings interact with it. And that's where there's the disconnect. It's the same thing like, um, to use another example, uh, Apple hates buttons. And so Apple constantly keeps removing buttons from devices over time. And they want the devices to always be thinner and better and sleeker and, you know, perfect Johnny Ives white world. And you look at how that has moved backwards recently 
on several Apple devices where they just shipped a new Apple TV remote that's way thicker and heavier and has more buttons because as it turns out, this super sleek glass and aluminum aluminum remote fell right through the cracks of your couch. You couldn't tell which way was up and had all these human interaction problems with it. Even though theoretically it was a beautiful object that could belong in a museum of art, it wasn't actually that useful. And I think of password example, or I think of examples like that, where stuff has been taken too far, and then we have to come back to, okay, but what's the actual human interaction part of it? And I don't know if I have a lot of recommendations here as far as, you know, what best practices are better in theory than they are in practice, but I, I think that's the kind of things we should be looking at, right? Where this makes sense in a vacuum, but this doesn't make sense in the real world. So I think his example is at least interesting and we should think about it, although I still think it's wrong, where he's talking about maybe not completely adhering to the principle of least privilege because if admins have a little more visibility, they might be able to track an anomaly a little farther. Now, I think the downsides are outweighed there where you are also allowing an attacker potentially more lateral movement more easily, and that's bad. So maybe that's not the right example, but I see where he's coming from on that if you think of it in the context of like my password example. And that's where, again, as I kind of let off the show saying, we're not doing a good enough job, we need to do better. This is where we should challenge our assumptions and that's a healthy conversation to have. I think the example he gave is wrong, but I think the thought process is not entirely wrong, that we should challenge our assumptions and we should challenge these best practices because why are we always falling short? Why are companies not doing this? Why don't they know how to prioritize? I am still just blown away at companies that don't have MFA deployed broadly yet because I get tired of saying it over and over and over that it's like literally the most effective information security control you can deploy. And I know there's a million excuses not to, but just go do it like for real. And um, why isn't that message getting to where it needs to be? Why isn't, why aren't organizations getting the green flag to go do that? Those are questions worth asking. Why aren't we able to prioritize better? So there's, there's something here, even though the example he gives is not right. I love your password example because it reminds me of this great comedian um, clip that I saw about password complexity in the fact that when passwords first came out, you had your favorite password. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, the best practice was to have a capital letter. So what do people do? Capitalize the first letter of their password, their favorite password. And then all of a sudden, now we need to have a number. Okay, well, I'm gonna add the number one. So everyone adds the number one at the end of it. And then now we need a special character. Okay, well, exclamation mark. So everyone has capital letter, their favorite password, one exclamation mark. Mm -hmm. And that's probably 90% of the people out there who are using something like that for complexity, which is probably not what we intended as information security professionals when we come out with that practice, but that's in practice what people are doing. Right? Mm -hmm. So there's that disconnect. So I think it's a great example. And it is important to challenge what we think. We're always trying to improve, right? Uh, Doug talked about last week where sometimes we have to compromise based on the business and it's good enough, but we're always striving. We're not going to forget that we need to still improve. And that's another point is that in reality, in the business world and in enterprise, information security is always a compromise. Everything you do is always a compromise. Security is a slider between usability and security. If it's so secure that you can't get into it, then it's great, right? It's completely secured and locked down, but it's unusable. If I were to have my house have a set of laser wires that I had to cross, a retinal scan to get in, bars on the door, you know, multiple locks, it's going to be a pain to get in, but it's super secure, right? <laughs> so it's always going to be a compromise between what is actually usable and what is actually secure. So I think you're never going to get that 100%. And yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, one of his, one of his points was that we should strive to be unbreachable, but I really think that's a pipe dream. I don't think it's actually possible 
in this day and age to be, even if you did all the best practices, I still think that there's no way that you can be unbreachable because we're humans. using software. Yeah, it's humans, right? We're using software that is being released with bugs, is being released with vulnerabilities, operating systems, firewalls, VPN. I mean, like everything has bugs, everything has vulnerabilities. And so even if you were to do all the best practices, there's just no way. And, you know, it's hard. Defenders have to be right all the time. Attackers only have to be right once. And they change their tactics. They're getting better at finding vulnerabilities. They're getting better at finding holes. And, uh, yeah, I just I think the his dream of having a an unbreachable company is is that a pipe dream right well i still see this mindset a lot and i actually think it's a undesirable mindset to have a lot of organizations still operate in this model that we are going to put all our eggs in the prevention basket and if they get through then we kind of don't know you know it's what happens if the attacking army does breach your moat and does breach the castle walls. What are you going to do then? We don't know. That was, we, we put all our eggs in that basket. And um, that's, I think where a lot of this conversation, when you hear things like assume breach, you know, and, and kind of spread out across improving your detection time and reducing dwell time and improving your response time that comes from the mindset of, as opposed to putting all your eggs in one basket, make sure you have a plan throughout. Okay, we've detected a security incident. It appears somebody has gotten past a couple lines of defense. Now what? And we need to have that plan in place. Are we doing proactive hunting? How are we discovering it? How are we reducing dwell time? If we find them here, what's our plan to get them out? On and on and on. Most companies, when they have a really bad situation, they're making it up as they go. You can tell. And it's, I mean, I don't blame them. I am, believe me, I am, I have chosen my career path for a reason so that I don't ever have to go do that because I have walked into offices and I've looked at people in the face who have not slept for 48 hours because they're going through a really tough time. And I do not envy them. That is, that is a really hard thing to do. And I, um, Hmm. I'm trying to think of how I want to put this. It's important to have that strategy planned out, I guess is what I'm saying. It's not that you are giving up on protection. It's important to think holistically and have the plan for all scenarios of an incident. And I do think there's absolutely value in a defense in depth strategy. And so I also would disagree with what he's saying because, and, and this, this, messages kind of come up throughout this conversation that Professor Gwynn seems to be a little old school in some of his thinking, because it's not like it used to be where we had a security incident, they got through a layer of security and we're doomed. The, the end is near. Um, anymore, if you're doing it right, somebody can get in and get like a user account and your user doesn't have admin on their endpoint and they don't have privilege beyond what they're doing in say office 365 and they have access to that one person's email and that's it and we have advanced auditing turned on so we can do um detection down to the individual message what the attacker did and didn't read and so we can do a very targeted breach notification to the affected parties and that's it they didn't get to the crown jewels. They didn't get on the network. They didn't gain lateral movement. That's still a security incident, but it's not the end of the world. And that's the other part of it, is that containment concept. And that's where, again, I, I think it's just Professor Gwen maybe has been out of the real world a little bit and, and in academia a little too long, that there isn't that understanding that anymore, we don't have that moat and castle model. So any initial compromise is not doesn't mean they have access to everything and that's okay. That's fine because if we can stop them further down the kill chain, if we stop them before they get to the end, which is, you know, exfiltrate everything and delete all your steps, um, then we're doing something right. And that is, that is a desirable goal too. One of his other points that he made in his article is that he proposed making a one strike and you're out hiring policy for information security employees. If they fail, don't let it happen twice is what he said. 
And then he also went further and said, never hire an information security employee that has worked for a company that has had a security industry saying that, you know, the industry best practices didn't work for that employer. So why would they work for you? I highly disagree with this particular point. I think number one, if we were to fire everyone after a breach, you wouldn't have many people working in the industry after a certain amount of time. Like Doug said last week, you know, 18,000 CISOs and companies would be firing all of their employees after the solar winds breach. As well as, you know, I think there's valuable lessons to be learned when there's an incident. There's a difference between a mistake and negligence. I think back to when I was in law enforcement and my wife is in medicine and both of those industries, they're, you learn from different cases. You learn from different experiences. When something comes in, you may be seeing it for the first time. You may have the basis a knowledge of what it could be, but you might have to do some research. You might have to ask a friend or figure it out on the fly on what to do. And that may not always be the right way to do it. And hopefully the end result is correct. You know, for example, in law enforcement, whenever there was a high risk incident, we always debriefed afterwards. And the first questions were, was anyone hurt? Okay, no, that's good. Was anyone, did anyone's constitutional rights get violated? No, that's a good thing. Okay, was the end result what you wanted? Yes, okay, good. Now, when we got from point A to point B, was that the right way to do it? Did we learn anything from that? And if it wasn't, okay, well, next time you see it, then you're going to do it better. And that's the same thing with information security. Did the attacker get the crown jewels? No. Okay. Did they break into our defenses? Yes. Okay. So let's figure out how that can't happen again. I think firing people after a security incident, I mean, Security practitioners aren't the ones who assume the risk. They're not the ones who make the decision. I saw one of the comments on his LinkedIn post was, it was called, they use an acronym called HIPPO, which was highest paid person's opinion. And that person always makes the decision. And so we've talked about it many times. Our job is to consult and make recommendations and hopefully implement those best practices. But sometimes the business says no. For example, we talk about local admin on the show right now. Best practice and the least amount of risk is to not have your users be local admins on their workstations. Is that a feasible best practice for every single company out there? Can we remove local admin rights for every single user at every single company? It probably won't happen. I mean, it's not feasible. It's a best practice for sure. And it will reduce your risk, absolutely. But not everyone can do it. So I think because every company has a different level of their maturity and their security stance, you're always going to have breaches and you're always going to have people who work for those companies who are working really, really hard to try and prevent those things. But because of the situation it may be out of their hands. This was easily the worst advice in the whole article. That's just indefensible. People learn from the challenges they go through and look no further than this show. We had Gavin Ashton on the show a couple, well, a while ago now, a couple months ago, and he went through some pretty awful times at Maersk. Not a lot of that was his fault. But if you apply Professor Gwynn's policy, Gavin Ashton would be unhirable. But instead, he took his learnings from that, published some great blog posts about it that have been widely used and cited as an example of how we can all learn and get better. If he was afraid to share those learnings with us and with the community, if that guy was unhirable, which he's a tremendous talent, how much worse would the industry be? You'd have people who were afraid to do anything for fear 
of failure as opposed to to learn and get better. And by the way, Gavin just took a new job at Microsoft. He's a cloud security architect now. Hey, Gavin, how's it going? Um, that's that's pretty awesome, right? And and there's a guy who, again, wasn't responsible for Maersk and has certainly shared that story to help make companies better. And I think that's just a perfect example of of anybody who's been involved in a security incident can use that to make themselves better, to make their companies better. And if they're willing and able to share what they can, which I know a lot of companies want to be pretty hush hush about that with the community so we can all get better. And that's, there's no better way to learn than, Hey, we didn't get this right, but we'll get it the next time. So this is, this is just bananas conversation to me and not something I'd want to consider. Andy, I, I think you and I are probably both on higher bowl in professor Gwynn's mind, if that's the case, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about your opinions on this comment that he made too about blind reliance on vendor products because <laughs> <laughs> he, he made a comment about how people should understand at a technical level what a vendor's product is doing like he said you know if you are in charge of security and you don't understand tcip to an architecture level transport layer and below and you can actually read network uh, packet caps and understand what's going on then you're not qualified to do the job and then you know they, he's saying that people are buying products that they don't understand and it's like this magic box that's going to basically take all of your security problems away but you don't understand what's going on within that magic box so you know i do think that again people in charge of security should be somewhat technical do i think they need to be able to read a pcap oh my god i mean network <laughs> no. traffic is <laughs> network traffic is important but I think, you know, even understanding at a higher level of how the zero trust model works these days and the cloud and endpoint management, uh, data, I mean, like there's a lot of other things other ne than network traffic, especially now you know, after the pandemic where we're maybe not even connecting to our corporate networks anymore. So, yeah, I mean, what do you think about the whole vendor reliance thing? Well, the other thing, too, is interesting about like security decision makers and leaders needing to be able to read a PCAP. Doug touched on this last week on this show where he talked about how people and technology are kind of at two opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of a lot of us are attracted to technology because we like the fact that it's very binary, very binary, very on off predictable behavior, predictable results. If I do something a certain way, I always get this outcome to a lot of our brains that really are drawn to order and um, predictability and everything else. Technology checks all those boxes and then human beings by their very nature are none of those things. <laughs> they are not predictable. You do not always get the same outputs from the same input as an example. And to be a good people manager is to be able to manage those things really well, those carbon-based life forms. And sometimes you can do both and the really good leaders can do both. And it sounds like Doug's one of them as we talk through it. Um, he might not be reading PCAPs anymore, but maybe he's capable. But the point stands that those are unicorns to be able to do opposite ends of the spectrum and, and have both of that appeal to you. And that doesn't mean you're bad at one or the other because you have an affinity for one or the other. And so I reject that idea that leaders need to do that. Again, I said at the top of the show, I do think you need to have like the fundamentals of technology and understand all the pieces. I have had IT leaders that didn't know what an IP address was. I think that's a little far. Do you need to, again, do you need to explain all the intricacies of the TCP IP you know, protocol at a very low level? No, too, but there needs to be some middle ground there. But then to your point about vendor black boxes, this is you know, a bigger discussion I think we could have on the show down the road. So I'll try to give a short version here. And in full disclosure, whenever this comes up, I should mention that I'm an enterprise security executive at Microsoft. My job is literally to be pre-sales for our security tools across Microsoft 365 and Azure. And one of the things Microsoft does when we go in and attempt to sell these products and pitch them to customers is that we have a level of visibility and a volume of signal that is unmatched in the industry. This is our pitch. And we do that by running 
many, many different consumer and enterprise cloud services and being able to take all of those signals, 8 trillion signals a day, and then build a threat intelligence model that feeds into our different products. It is literally a black box because it is unknowable to humankind to process the concept of 8 trillion signals a day that feed machine learning models that feed all the different tools and what makes them go. It's not possible to know all of that. But our argument is, if you are an enterprise and you are trying to protect yourself, you do not have the volume of data and signal to understand the threat landscape at a broad level. You only see your little segment of the internet, your little chunk of the world. And if you haven't seen an attack yet, then you don't know how to defend it. But when you work with Microsoft and you have tools that use Microsoft's threat intelligence feed, you can be this customer sitting in Madison, Wisconsin in the United States, and you can benefit from the knowledge of an attack happening in Cape Town, South Africa on a different customer because that protection is gonna get built across the whole platform. Do you need to understand how all that works at an architectural level? Well, it's not an option because the architecture is not gonna be presented to you, but are you better off by rejecting that and saying, well, if that's a black box and I can't see it, I don't want it. Like, do you, not, do you wanna turn that down? Some customers do, to be sure. I mean, we haven't sold everybody in the Microsoft security platform, otherwise they wouldn't have a job. But I think there's an argument to be made sometimes that there are trade-offs. If you roll your own on everything and you do everything in-house and you rely solely on your own threat intelligence and solely on things that you can evaluate end-to-end, -end, stuff that's only open source, you're only gonna be able to deliver a certain amount of protection for you. And maybe you will be better protected in some key ways, but my job relies on me making the other argument that without the visibility of a broader scale of cloud scale signal, you're not gonna be able to protect yourself as effectively. So we're fond of saying security, the cloud is a security imperative is the quote we say at Microsoft. And, and so again, that's to be completely fair, that's a vendor sales pitch, right? That's, that's my job. Um, is there something to that? Well, I'll leave the listener to decide today, but that, that's that's kind of the counter argument here to, to what Professor Gwynn is saying. And I absolutely understand both perspectives, but I have run into so many customers that have such a hard time doing things like securing an ADFS environment because the volume of attacks that come in all day, every day is just more than they can handle. And they would be better off focusing on things that are strategic to their enterprise, as opposed to trying to protect a cloud facing identity platform when somebody's already doing it at a much broader scale than they are. And that's, that's the counter argument. That makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. My final point is, you know, as I read through his article, you know, we've said it multiple times, I, I do think the best practices work. Should they be challenged? Absolutely. We are always looking to find better ways to protect enterprises. I think the breaches are happening because not everyone is able to implement everything. So there's always gonna be a trade-off and there's always gonna be an amount of acceptable risk. To Professor Gwynn's point, is that acceptable? The amount of risk that you are accepting on behalf of users, maybe not. Maybe there should be less risk. Maybe there should be no risk. I don't know what the right answer is, but I think that getting us to talk about it is important. Mm -hmm. And then about technologists in general and, and having more technical people in InfoSec, I do think that that is important too. I've mentioned that when I mentor people coming up in the industry, I notice that they're often going on about pen testing and red teaming when the majority of jobs are in blue teaming and protecting enterprises. And I do think we need to have people on blue team because I mean, not only is it important, but I think it's hard because there's so many things you need to know as a blue teamer versus like a red teamer, red teamers, you know, you're trying to focus on again, that attack, finding those vulnerabilities, but blue teamers need to kind of know a little bit about everything. I play a lot of tennis in my off time is one of my hobbies 
And when I was coming up and, and playing in high school, I had a coach who said, you know, out of the four things in tennis, your forehand, your backhand, your volley, and your serve, those are your four basic types of strokes. You have to have one strength and no weaknesses. So there can't be anything that hurts you, but you have to have at least one strength out of all of those. And that's how you become a good tennis player. And I'd say that's the same thing with an inf- information security generalist in the fact that you need to have a general knowledge in pretty much all the things out there when it comes to the pillars of information security. And you have to be technically deep in one or two of those. So the worst that you can be at any pillar in information security would be that you're basically competent in that when it comes to AppSec or network security or endpoint protection. I mean, out of all those, you have to at least be competent to speak to it, to be able to protect it and then find an area that you're passionate about and become technically deep in that. So I do think he has a point. We need more technical people, not just paper pushers. So, uh, and that's, that's my, that's my final thoughts on that. This was fun to talk about this article. And like we said up front, props to professor Gwen for putting his thoughts out there. Props to him for getting us talking about it. And I think we can ask some uncomfortable questions. I think we can look around and say, why are we collectively so bad at this? Why aren't we doing better? What can we do better? Okay, we have all these best practices. Why aren't they more broadly deployed? What is holding us back from doing that? It's not necessarily that they're wrong, but maybe they're not accounting for human factors. Absolutely agree. I want to see more technologists, more people that can get hands on with keyboard and fix stuff than people who are creating barriers and paperwork and processes and everything else. And many processes are good, by the way. Like, I am not for cowboy wild wild west it department i want change control by all means as much as it's a pain i want it i want people to follow it but at the same time i think we need to get better about instead of doing things in a vacuum like i talked about with procurement which was kind of my soapbox of the day doing things in the real world and thinking about how they affect human beings who are ultimately the weakest link in any information security strategy so there's a lot of opportunity to get better but hey, we're doing a lot of things right too. Um, my favorite thing that I would encourage more people to do moving forward is do what Gavin Ashton did with learning from our mistakes and sharing them with the community. And I know that's hard because at almost every company, no company wants to talk about their security incident. They want to sweep it under the rug and move on as fast as possible. And it's probably not going to be in many cases a good career move to fight to be able to share that. But it did work for Gavin, didn't it? He did all right um, and has done all right from sharing that. And it's something quoted broadly in the community now is looking at the lessons learned from Maersk and what we could do better. So great conversation, great chance to kind of step back and look at ourselves in the mirror and say what we're doing well and where we could do better and you know, keep trying to move onward and upward. I generally think information security professionals have some of the best growth mindset of anybody I've worked with. And then at the same time, there are some of them who have a very fixed mindset. They're already a know-it-all. They already know everything and they are always right. I want to see more growth mindset moving forward, but I'm going to give credit where credit's due. I think most people in this business understand that you are never done learning, especially in this business. And you constantly have to be reevaluating your own assumptions and what you've been doing and how you can be better. And hopefully everybody up and down the reporting chain is having that same conversation. And so if Professor Gwen gets us to have those conversations, then this op-ed is actually really successful, even if some of the advice is really bad. <laughs> well, that's our show for this week. Thanks for listening. As always, our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have any questions about the episode or want us to talk about any topics that you have in mind. Thanks. And we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.